Hey guys, welcome. This is my first episode in the Maker Mistaker podcast. Um, just something that I thought I needed to get get out and, and happen in this world, and here it is. This is the first episode, and my name is Jeff Finley, and I'm, I'm interviewing today someone who's inspired me. Her name is Gigi Young. She is a, an intuitive. She also provides coaching services and stuff. And actually, I hired her a few weeks ago to provide me some mentoring and coaching services. I don't know why I shelled out the cash to pay a, a coach, but it's like it's, it just seems like I'm the people that inspire me. I want to converse with them and have a real conversation with them, and, and it seemed to be the most accessible way to do it. So, and obviously, if you're listening, you know you're you're kind of hearing someone else speak about topics that interest you. So, I'm going to you know show you some people that inspire me on this podcast. And Gigi just happens to be the first one. So, say hello, Gigi. Hi. So I'm going to read off the bio from Gigi's website, okay? Um, She currently resides in the beautiful Dundas, Ontario, about 40 minutes out of Toronto. And her best days are spent riding out on the trails with her golden retriever or out about in the community. She spent most of her young adulthood in the fashion world, traveling and by default living quite the interesting life. She had the opportunity to experience many different cultures, religions, and people, and it seemed like each location had a certain vibration or energy, a set of lessons or karma. It was tough for a little while, but she could merge with the people and absorb their spirit. This helped open her mind, and it allowed her to take on a more altruistic approach to life. And instead of partying, she would be studying metaphysical subjects and getting up early to take the train to some spiritual site. She's now retired and saves enough money to buy a home and start a business. It's funny to say that you're now retired because I still think you've got many, many years ahead of you. (laughs) And um, she called it Cosmic Gypsies. It's based on working one-on-one with individuals to help them remember who they are, as well as provide classes to empower them and inspire them. She also is passionate about giving talented teachers and practitioners a platform to express themselves. And her blog, um, ggyoung.com, is her work through communication with her higher self and tireless research into this field. It's, an ex- it's a, intended to inspire and hopefully help others make sense of the world. She's an intuitive. She works from a claircognitive, empathetic, and occasionally a clairvoyant level, meaning she's kind of psychic. <laughs> when it comes to making sense of life, she believes that she has all... Of, she has... When it comes to making sense of life, she believes that we all have a piece of the puzzle. We each have vital information that inspires and helps others. And her blog is dedicated to expressing her pieces of the puzzle. And so, obviously, this is my podcast. This is part of the Maker Mistaker blog, my own pers- my own piece of the puzzle. So here we are combining our pieces. We're going to see um, what we what we bring out together in this in this podcast and where the conversation leads. I have a feeling it's going to get very deep and esoteric, but then also very grounded and down to earth. I hope so for people to understand. So that's uh, Gigi in a nutshell, but um, I'll give her the floor and let her explain to you, in her own words, what she's up to. Great. Thanks, Jeff. Well, I haven't heard my bio read to me. It's made me realize how much things have changed. Mm -hmm. I'm an intuitive, and I spend most of my time doing one-on-one sessions with people, coaching and, and being an intuitive, and writing, and it's my passion, and I love what I do. And yeah, that's me. <laughs> so I found your videos on YouTube. Um, so you've got a YouTube channel, right? So people can find you. They can search Gigi Young on YouTube. And you've got like various topics that you cover that like help people out in situations. Yes. <laughs> so you're an intuitive. Um, and sometimes I think that used to be called psychic, right? So what is psychic versus an intuitive? They're essentially the same thing. Um, it's just that the word psychic has a lot of stigmas to it and, you know, like Miss Cleo or it's sort of the older word Mm -hmm. for intuitive for, you know, being a clairvoyant or whatever ability you have. And as the ability evolves and the way that psychics work evolves, we also, a lot of psychics essentially have chosen to change the name to intuitive to represent a new way of, of working, a new way of functioning. Yeah, so let's talk about that stereotype, the skepticism, because I, you know, I've told a few people that, like, oh, I hired an intuitive, and they don't know what that is, and I'm like, okay, I hired a psychic, and I immediately can tell that their eyes glaze over, and they're like, oh, what, you can't figure it out on your own? You're going to go consult the crystal ball? Um, so that, that's kind of the look that they give me, but I mean, 
it's like, you know, the, the, the insight that you give the person that you gave me seems really legit and seems really grounded and authentic. Um, so like, why do people have these stereotypes of uh, psychic individuals or people that have this, this type of ability? Hmm. Probably because, you know, I'm not sure why people tend to have that, but I do know that generally any time that you start diving into the undercurrents of why things happen, energy, spirituality, there's a lot of personal responsibility with that. Mm -hmm. So the minute you start getting into, you know, do ghosts exist or not, or do I create my own reality, that you cannot get into that without on some level accepting that parts of you might change. And for a lot of people, that is terrifying. Mm -hmm. It is completely terrifying that they may have to release belief systems and paradigms that they've been using for a long time. And to them, it can feel like death. Um, So a lot of people that are really skeptical and and super or, or, you know, um, not believing in this stuff or uncomfortable around it, it's not that they're uncomfortable around the un- the unseen as much because we all know that there's so much more to be here. It- it's the fact that there's parts of them that might have to die. That's what I believe. That might have to change. Yeah, and I think that's they don't even really realize that. I think to, to the, you know to why something like a psychic or esoteric subjects you know or aliens or something like that might cause a reaction in them. They don't really know where that reaction comes from. I mean, I personally know that. I have those reactions. It's almost like I want to believe in aliens, but then it's like when people start talking seriously about it, they there's always the stereotype that there's some sort of crackpot or loony tune or something that they just uh, they don't have a grounded base in reality or science or proof or evidence. They don't know how to solve problems for themselves, so they look to the stars for answers, or they 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 look for superstitions or um, you know fairy tales or something like that and they have this skewed version of reality and that was the stereotype you know well in in the psychic realm when someone says you consulted a psychic most people like to think that they're a charlatan or they're just out to get your money by reading your fortune or they'll give you like a a very general uh like prediction or horoscope that you can kind of adapt to your life and you're like oh yeah that makes sense to me like i can see where all my struggles fit into this very generalized description Absolutely. And I think that because there's, because an intuitive deals with the unseen and essentially um, the unmanifested, it's kind of like this huge darkness or, the, or this huge gray area. And I think there's in the past and in the present, a lot of people use that to exploit and they use that to take money from people. And mm-hmm. it's, there's, I mean, it doesn't mean that every single intuitive does that. It doesn't mean that everyone does, but it just takes a few bad apples to taint the whole, to taint your whole idea of them because people are very vulnerable when they're talking about their life. Yeah. And you know, if someone's just trying to get your money, it's really offensive. So there is a lot of stereotypes around people like Miss Cleo and there are a lot of opportunists that will say that they're a psychic and read scripts. And a lot of the scripts really do work. Um, And at the end of the day, that's why whenever you do go to an intuitive, you understand that it's, you don't give your power to them. You have a conversation with them like a normal person and you, you, you listen to what they say. You run it through your consciousness, through you, and you try to, um, you know, don't take, you know, necessarily tons of financial advice or, life and death advice necessarily um, and just make sure that you're using your own head and that you're questioning it. Yeah. People Um, take advice from all sorts of sources throughout the day. I mean, they're, they're either reading in the magazine or a newspaper or a blog article. They'll believe a lot of the things they read, but, but they, 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 they base their judgment on, well, how credible is the source? You know, like, Oh, this is Huffington post. Well, it must be true. Or this is a posted on, you know, somebody that I, or someone I trust, you know, so they, they have this, the trust factor. So for example, like you have to build your trust, obviously as a blogger or any person in the, in the industry, you have to build this, the trust with the audience for them to take you seriously. And when you start talking about esoteric subject matter, there's an immediate wall that goes up. I think for, for one, there is, I do think there is a malintentive program to try to 
to try to stereotype on purpose the type of esoteric um, subject matter. And I didn't really believe that until I started getting into the whole consciousness uh, subject matter. And when and I noticed my own judgments pop up. As soon as my my mom, for example, would tell me about the Illuminati and conspiracies, and and she was all into the ghost hunting shows on TV, and and I thought that she was just getting entertained by the drama of it, of it all, and I kind of thought that she was crazy. So I just like quit bogging me down with political BS. I'm not interested. I have my own thing going on. So stop trying to make me scared of the world, you know. And I didn't. I didn't. I wanted to ignore it. And so that, that the wall was immediately up. But once I started having my awakening and, re- and recognizing these judgments that I have is when the wall started coming down and I allowed myself to explore subjects that really interested me, which happened to become the, like, um, for, first it started with the just g- generic, like the ego and the true self and the false self. And then it got into Buddhism and religions and spirituality. And so I noticed all these walls coming down. And then when, and then when it got into aliens and ETs, it was almost like this, this, uh, this thing happened to me where I was like, Oh shit, I'm heading towards like the, the crazy town. The weirdo, and, weirdo land. Yeah. Weirdo land. It's no longer about Buddhism and Zen. It's now it's about like weirdo land. Okay. But it sounds to relate. And I'm like, there's, the, I saw, I noticed a, uh, a curiosity in me that just was like fearless that it wanted to dive in. But then I noticed the flip side of like, am I going to become one of them? You know? Yeah, it's a lonely place. When you start, when you start believing in aliens, it's a lonely, <laughs> it, it can feel like a lonely place. <laughs> And yeah. I know that you talk about them, but let me let me say that um, what made me hire you was you built trust through your YouTube channel. I watched you, I, and and the, the the things that you said resonated with me. They made sense. Like I, you know, coming from a skeptical background, which I, you know, you can get into your atheist background growing up. You weren't always this way, um, but coming from the skeptical background, like just the way you approach the subjects and everything you built trust with me. So like, and I want to have a conversation with you and I've and experienced enough as I am in this sort of, uh, in this arena as I am so far, it's only been about a year and a half. Um, I've definitely learned that you can't believe everything you say. You've got to discern. You have to figure out for yourself. You can't just buy into everything at face value. Um, so, but you kind of had a skeptic grow upbringing, right? Yeah, absolutely. So how did you transition? So talk about that. Yeah, I was raised um, in a, like an agnostic household, so my parents didn't want me to um, go to religion, have a religion, or go to church. They wanted me to essentially find my own belief system. Mm-hmm. So I, they, 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 like any kind of indoctrinating of me was discouraged. So wow. basically, um, my mom had sort of a spiritual leaning toward, like more of a spiritual leaning, and my dad had more of an atheist like leaning so but not but they didn't really talk to me about anything so it was kind of a, more of a neutral uh upbringing where it definitely wasn't encouraged um but at the same time it was sort of neutral and I was able to really dig into esoterics which I was naturally attracted to without having anything from the Bible or any religious texts in the back of my mind making me feel guilty about it. Mm-hmm. So there was that. <laughs> and what, when you started learning about your, these, this, that type of subject matter, did you have friends or people that you knew that kind of looked at you differently? Or how was the reaction amongst your peers? Yeah, I've always actually been a weirdo amongst my peers. Um, so I think being into that kind of stuff, it makes people really uncomfortable. General, a lot of like it made people I think uncomfortable that I was, but also people were really fascinated. I find that when you're um, a spiritual person at at, at any age, mm-hmm. um, or someone who's into you know esoterics, it tends to be a very polarizing way to be. So people will either be completely freaked out at you and make fun of you and call you a witch or a devil or, or whatever because they're completely uncomfortable with you, mm-hmm. or they'll completely love you and want to hang out with you and, and they'll tell you every single story that, <laughs> of a scary experience they've had and you, you can't get away from them. So I find that even when I was younger, it was quite a polarizing experience. It's definitely not something that you just bring up in a conversation 
and it just sinks. You know, you just oh, okay, and move on. It's it, it it's polarizing for sure. Yeah, like I I feel like I I always want to go there in conversations. Like, do you find yourself <laughs> always, always just wanted to just cut past the small talk? <laughs> <laughs> totally, because at the end of the day, like thinking about the bigger picture is what really um, is what really creates change in our life in a lot of ways. So I always want to go there too. I, I, I always go there anyway. So, I mean, I really think that unless you're living your life, like it's performance art, you're not really living it. So. Yeah, that's a pretty awesome uh, way of, way of looking at it. Mm-hmm. Of course, most people live their life um, reacting to all the circumstance of the daily grind. Absolutely. And then, and then having huge party weekends and, and everything yeah. just to release the pressure that's built up through living the, 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 the daily grind. Yeah, that's a good point. You mentioned in your bio that, you know, instead of partying, you were studying metaphysical stuff. I, I was never a big partier. I, I, I always wanted to, I, I spent my time creating music and writing and creating art and like actually making something. And I felt like partying, well, I was a non-drinker, non-substance abuser. I was actually very anti-drug growing up, um, which is kind of interesting now that I've sort of come around. I haven't done any drugs, but like my view on them has completely changed, you know, I think as I mature. But um, so what was your take on like, in, did you go to college or in, did you have an experience in, in, in that part of your life? Yeah, yeah, I did. I did go to school, um, but I, I really started working in fashion pretty much like seriously, pretty much like right after high school. So I mean, all my partying was introduced via that scene, and and I mean, the, I mean, the fashion world and partying. I mean, pretty much, you know, partying is networking, and <laughs> yeah. you know, so you're. It, it is weird if you don't take it, and a lot of a lot of booze is free. A lot of drugs are free um, in that world as well. Um, but I mean, I, it always. I've always been really sensitive and and empathic. And I always felt sort of a dirty energy with it, mm-hmm. uh, a toxic, a toxic energy with it. And yeah. it was always, for whatever reason, it was always really palpable for me. And, yeah, I get the same vibe. <laughs> like, and 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 I, I got this hiding vibe, like I, like like you're hiding, and that it just wasn't productive. It, it just, it just, there were all these different fragments of pieces that just didn't resonate with me. So I, I did party somewhat, like like. Like nothing crazy. Like mm-hmm. I'm not into drugs at all, and I never, I never have been. Um, but um, yeah, it's it's never been something that it's never been a phase that I really had to go through. Like I know for some people it is. So let's shift gears a little bit. Would you mind getting into your fashion background? Uh, yeah, uh, sure. I worked as a model for probably about eight years. Oh wow! Yeah. So I, I worked, um, I worked all over the place as a fashion model, and yeah, that, that was me. It gave me a lot of free time. I mean, it, you're, you're very busy, but there's a lot of playing, so there's a lot of waiting. So you're able to kind of get a pretty good education in the in between times when you're in transition. Or I used to listen to a lot of podcasts in the makeup chair. <laughs> you know? Oh yeah, what kind of podcasts? Um, I can't remember. I mean, at the time, I was really into healthy food, so I used to listen to like a lot of raw vegan things, okay. um, and then also like anything that was spiritual, anything that was. Um, I got near the end of that. I got into ET things, and I, I started to love ET channelings and basically anything that was um, esoteric mainly and yeah. kind of like I, I i i seem to like the strange things too so now yeah. do you ever wonder why you're interested in that stuff at like esoteric yeah like why are you so drawn to it and not like um shopping or sports or uh you know <laughs> other things you know i i i don't think it was a choice mm-hmm. it wasn't it wasn't a choice that i made it was just something that I am and it was actually something that I tried to suppress when I was younger because it's it is polarizing and it's more 
something that just sort of came out and unfolded. And I, you know, I didn't, you know, dear diary, I would like to be a, I would like to talk about aliens on the internet. You know, it was never, (laughs) you know, it was never something that I planned or that I, you know, wanted. It was just something that literally came forward the minute that I relaxed, the minute that I became coherent, the minute that I let go, this would come forward. So it's like, I feel like everybody has, innate aspects of themselves that innate truths and this is just being into this stuff and and being an intuitive is my innate truth so that's how i feel yeah um i think that part of the point of life is to realize that (laughs) what your innate truth is your natural state um absolutely because it's uh, the only state that will make you happy yeah, it's like everyone's trying to find happiness, and we obviously we're being sold happiness through products and external and all that kind of stuff, and through religion and through third parties, and everyone else is going to make you happy. And you know, you hear the stories, like you hear the people who had it all and then lost it all, um, and then then it's you're like, well, I'm going to try that for myself. You know, like I I need to get there. And I for a long time I thought it's like I, I intuitively knew what that I wanted was something authentic and real. And I couldn't actually have like a dead end job or any sort of corporate ladder career. I couldn't do that. Um, so I was definitely a self starter right off, right out of college. Once I realized I couldn't get a job, I'm like, this is, this is not for me. I'm just going to do my own thing. So, I mean, I, I think a lot of our listeners are very similar that they're DIYers, they're startups, they're, um, designers and artists and creatives and musicians that they start their own stuff so it's like they're 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 in you don't even have to really wake up to esoteric subject matters or spiritual concepts to kind of be in line with your true purpose i think most people are real close would you say that they're like especially artists and creatives i think that like that's to get into that you don't get into that without having a natural affinity absolutely there you know I may channel, I may be a channel and channel intuitive stuff and, and you, like when it comes to channeling, you're very intuitive well, as well and you channel music, but everybody has their own, their own way of interpreting. Imagine we're all filters and the, the way that we, in, the, the, the way that we let spirit or universal energy flow through us is different for everybody and it comes out in a different way once it runs through our filter. So some people create music, some people are even more scientific. I really do believe that artists are not just the hard, um, you know, uh, painters, musicians, and mm-hmm. things like that. I believe that art is any kind of inspired, creative. It can even be scientific. It can be solving an equation. It can be engineering. That's all. That's to me. That's all inspired, and that's all art. Yeah, that that inspiration is a particular type of energy. It is. It is. It is that like divine moment where you are connecting to the collective Mm -hmm. and you're connecting to the higher part of you and you're being a voice for it. And that's why any great work of art or any great thing, no matter where you are, you'll probably connect with it on some level because it was created from the place that we all share. And that's why it feels different is because we can feel the gravity of that when we're creating it. We can feel that what we're what we're doing, what we're creating, is coming from that place that where we are all one. So we lose our identity when we do when we're genuinely and deeply, deeply creating and in that energy. And the deeper you are in it, the more you can feel it. Mm-hmm. But it's that we're creating from that place where we are one. It's the God space or you, the universe. Yeah, that's. And it's so interesting, too, where that inspiration comes differently for every individual, every person. Like, why partic- Why me and why am I so drawn to punk rock music? <laughs> <laughs> like, what is it about the energy and the, the drums? that? And, and same thing with uh, funk and soul breaks. Like, I, I'm a b-boy, I break dance, and something about yeah. the music just inspires me that I can't explain. But, like, I'm not attracted to maybe some other type of music. And so, but you know, music taste in general is, uh, it, it, it unlocks a part of themselves that I do think connects with the divine. They don't, they don't know it, but. Absolutely. I mean, everything that we enjoy is a mirror for who we are inside and it's a reflection and everything is just resonance and frequency 
at the end of the day, that's what it is. So we are drawn to and enjoy what, what whatever is resonant with us. Mm-hmm. And, and also that, that, that's also why our music taste changes as well. You might not like country music when you're young, you may travel, you may develop a taste for it and you may like it later because your as your resonances change, your personal soul vibrational frequency, as that changes, your, your tastes change too. So, yeah, that's a really awesome point. And I, can you go into more detail about resonance and energy and frequency? That's a word that, you know, sometimes people will hear that and they are confused or turned off or it doesn't make any sense to them. Yeah, yeah. And I think it's because we can't actually magnify our eyes to the point where we can see atoms <laughs> and molecules mm-hmm. like vibrating. Uh, so we don't <laughs> really like that very much. We like what's obvious. We feel safe in what's obvious. So the, talking about things like vibration and resonance can sort of feel uncomfortable because we can't automatically necessarily see it, but we can sense it. We can sense resonance. One really good way to understand sensing resonance is the resonance of emotions. So if you just walk into a room where someone's been told that their family member has died and you had no idea what was said, if you're quiet enough and you're still enough, like connected enough to your higher self and balanced, you will actually, and maybe even if you're not, probably, you will be able to feel in that room what's happened and you'll go, what's wrong? There's no reason why you necessarily, even if you're not seeing their faces, why you should ask them what's wrong, but you just know. Mm-hmm. It's, it's, it's via resonance and this information that's transferred behind the scenes between people and in the world. Also, people will walk into a building, and not even necessarily intuitive people, and maybe horrendous murders have taken place there. Even people who aren't intuitives will be like, I don't like this place. I don't know what it is about this place, but I don't like it. And that's because energy can be trapped in the pores of physical material and resonate out the experience, and you will sense it. So it's like an imprint. And that happens in old homes all over the place. So, so resonance is something that we're always that we're made of, but we're also always interpreting um, as animals. Mm-hmm. I like to think of it as notes on a piano. You know, like when you play a chord that you know that feels good. There's a reason why it feels good to you. Why you can describe it that way, like that's pleasing to me. If you were, and then whereas like a discorded note, you know, it feels unnerving and and uh, awkward to you. You can tell for something, and especially if you're playing a tune and you're like, that's obviously a wrong note. You know, you can tell like you just, it's not like you sat there and figured out the science or math behind it. You just have a, an immediate reaction of knowing that it's wrong or knowing that it's correct or feels right. And then especially yeah. when you, yeah. And especially when you come back home to like your root chord, it, it feels literally like you came back home. Um, you, you went on a journey, you came back home. And I think that, when you find stuff that brings you joy is, is you're resonating on those, on the things that feel like home to you. Absolutely. You're, you're just, it's all a reflection and it's on an intuitive level. And it's a lot simpler too than like, there's so much talk about find your passion and, and find your joy and follow your bliss and all this stuff. And sometimes it's a lot simpler. Like I overthink it. Like, I love playing music and I love writing music and stuff, but I don't give myself enough credit or like enough time. It's almost like it's, it's too fun to feel like real. Like that's my real purpose. You know, you ever get that? Yeah. It's, it's absolutely. Yeah. And, and then someone gave me the advice too. They, they said, you know, cause for example, keep people kept gifting me these pianos and I'm just like, well, maybe I need to play piano. Like I'm not, I'm not naturally drawn to the, to the keys, you know, I'm more of a drummer, but they, um, so I started pre- playing and then what someone told me that they said, well, it may not be playing piano is your purpose, but what it does is it puts you in a, a state of emotion that will open doors for you that wouldn't necessarily be there. It's almost like you're unlocking, opening up and it's, it could be a gateway to the next step, you know? Absolutely. I feel like happiness and 
inspiration and pleasure is just a pathway really to you just becoming a greater and greater version of yourself essentially yeah and it's like sometimes i'll wake up in the morning and i think what am i supposed to do today the world is wide open follow your joy okay what's going to bring me joy and a lot of times that's just going back to sleep because that feels really good <laughs> <laughs> how do you know how do you know like what your joy is versus what feels comfortable in the moment it's really hard it's really 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 hard to know um in the like in like what one which is which yeah um it's 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 the challenge that I think everybody faces is, is when am I feeding into my ego and when am I in the comfort zone and when am I actually thriving? Yeah, good, good. That's great. I love those words. <laughs> yeah, because there's a huge difference. And mm -hmm. I think that there is a time to be in your, in your comfort zone. A lot of the time that's when we go into our feminine cycle, our inward cycle, but there's also a time to move into the masculine cycle, which is to go out and break through barriers and get things done and be active. So it's a lot of people tend to be more um, towards one or the other. Like they live their life breaking down boundaries, being very active and they don't go into their comfort zone. They won't sleep in when they should. <laughs> Mm -hmm. They won't get enough sleep. They'll always push themselves. And then some people tend to be more, they'll tend to sleep in. They won't push themselves. They tend to be stuck in the same patterns and not bursting through. The same things are happening to them again and again because they're not being assertive. So usually we tend to fall somewhere more than the other one. And if, if you can figure out what your tendency is, do you have a tendency to keep moving and and be assertive and, and, and really active, more masculine in the way you live life? Or do you tend to be more feminine, more relaxed, um, not really setting yourself super high goals, if goals at all? So once you can figure out which one you tend to be in, you can begin challenging that and pushing out of it. So if you tend to be more assertive and pushing forward and active, you can make time for yourself to rest, make time for yourself to sleep in, and that will feel hard for you. If you're the other way, which is tend to sleep in more, um, tend to not push yourself, make excuses, then your thing would be to get going and have a routine that is challenging for you, that's more assertive for you. Yeah, and there's also the, uh, the constant bombardment of entertainment and fun, you know, things that other people have made, the companies have made that sort of give you the illusion of joy and happiness like because it's like well i consumed this coffee from starbucks i feel really good <laughs> it's following my joy baby <laughs> yeah i'm guilty of that one <laughs> you know and it's like ah oh, you know you rely on on that stuff um it's like you watch an uplifting movie or a an awesome you know inspiring music or song from someone else or you know or you just consume youtube videos of spiritual teachers or you know, uh, read a lot and i've i'm that's been me for the past year. I've been obsessed with reading and watching and consuming content. Of course, if I was consuming content that was like Family Guy or, uh, you know, something on television, I feel like it's a complete waste of time. But like, you know, there's part of me that's like connecting and I feel like I'm growing. But at yeah. some point, you got to go back and, like you said, in, in, go inside and integrate and get away from the media to um, really understand what's going to motivate you at a core level that's going to bring you joy out of nothing, without any influence from other people. Absolutely. Absolutely. Because so, so many times, if we are consuming a lot of media, you know, we will just repeat exactly what we've seen. So you really do have to take a media detox. You have to just get good at knowing what your voice is. If you've always been saturated with other people's voices buy this product drink this coffee how are you ever going to know your voice so you, you mm -hmm. it, it, it will be probably one of the most amazing things that we can do as human beings is to get to know our own voice and once we get to know what our heart sounds like and what feels good to us and, and who we genuinely are um we'll find that we come into this innate balance and, and making decisions becomes really easily because 
once we have a rapport with our heart and we know who we are, it just gets easier and easier to make difficult decisions and, and, um, and things become more obvious when you know what your voice is. Yeah, that's a great point. Uh, I think especially today when we on social media and Facebook and Pinterest and like for, for designers, especially artists and designers, there's like so much inspiration out there. Like, Every other blog you see is featuring 20 awesome typography, hand lettering, <laughs> chalk designs, or like, you know, 50 brilliant logos. I mean, it's like you can sit there and get consumed by these feeds. And you're seeing like the, the, the best, like half percent of the world's creation. And it's like the stuff that's bubbling up to be the most viral. Like even in blogging or writing, you're seeing like the best of the best. And then you look at your own work and you're like, well, I, I just don't have it in me. I can't be like them. You know, you get you get inspired and then you get discouraged. Yeah, I suppose there could be sort of that that cycle to to get to kind of ride the roller coaster of being really enthralled with something and then looking at where you feel you are and being like, err. <laughs> yeah. Err. <laughs> but I think that I think that it's good to always frame anytime we're we're digesting other people's art or or people who are accomplished it's good to always have have a precedent when you look at it that says I'm just going to take the pieces that I need and this is where I'm going this is where I'm going mm -hmm. and I wouldn't be attracted to this unless I had the potential to in some capacity do this at some level. So I am just going to let my subconscious mind take in all of this information and all of this energy and I'm going to let it kind of digest behind the scenes and I know, I know that this is going to move through me and that I'm going to create something better and better. Yeah, but, that's brilliant. Yeah, and, it, and so there is a point when we have to shut off our egoic mind, the mind that tells us you're not good enough, you can't create, and that is, and that's the moment where we turn on our, our we, we let our subconscious mind come forward, because our subconscious mind has this amazing way of processing things, working behind the scenes, and then giving you this flash of inspiration where you use it, and you won't realize that you use that those 10 topographies that were amazing you won't you you won't realize that that, that you use that as a, as a source of inspiration until you've done something because what your subconscious mind did is it took it and it integrated it it made it your own and it was reborn so a lot of creation like we were saying before is actually a subconscious and there isn't a lot of room for the egoic mind the mind that tells us we're not good enough because that's the analytical mind there's no there's not a lot of room for that in creation so it's best to look at creative projects with your heart and with your subconscious mind in a very relaxed state and to not even listen to your egoic mind to, to not even really mm -hmm. think about it make it kind of a subconscious or very relaxed thing where you just simply take it in and then don't do anything else with it and let your subconscious mind process it yeah that's a that's a wonderful point Gigi now let's see. I want to shift gears a little bit. Let's get into um, star seeds. Okay. So I wrote a post um, on my blog a few months ago, basically saying, "Am I a star seed?" And it was the first time I introduced the concept of of this of a star seed to my audience and to myself. Really, I was you know because I had a healing session done with a you know another person that inspires me that I heard on a podcast. I you know emailed them and. I'm like, I set up a, a shamanic healing soul retrieval session and she told me that I was a star seed. And then my, I immediately got like inspired. I'm like, oh, really? Am I really a star seed? That sounds so cool. And I didn't know what it was. So I looked it up and I'm like, oh, wow, this sounds really important. And, um, you know, like I got a mission or something in life. And what is it? And I kept, I became obsessed with reading about it and I found out all sorts of other things about it. Right. So, but, but. I think it's like, uh, it's, you know, be careful because I feel like it's um, something that my ego can get attached to as like it's another club of belonging. I feel like, oh, I can label myself something that's different from other people. Um, so what is a star seed and why does it even matter? Like, who cares? But like for, for the listeners, what is a star seed? I mean, you would probably classify yourself as a star seed, right? 
I, I would. So what I, is it? And the, the chances are our listeners are probably a star seed too. Yeah, I think that everybody essentially to some degree on this planet is a star seed. Um, I don't I don't really believe that it's an exclusive club, although our, our egos like to put that self-importance on that we're always like oh what, what star seed are you and mm -hmm. and that's fun and that and that's okay but at the end of the day if we really zoom out and look at it i think everybody is mm -hmm. and i think that the only reason it's kind of coming forward now is because we're in such an expansive cycle in all this information being able to pa pass through really quickly and you know spirituality is changing and going from really sec secular to sort of more personal and i think that's uh, really creating space for us to, you know, look at spirituality in more of a cosmic way. And when you look at the soul, the soul structure, um, it's basically um, a series of oversouls, essentially, that contain all different expressions of your soul. As you move up the soul, if you imagine the soul as kind of being moving up a cord, um, it, 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 it essentially has oversouls that encompass it. Have you heard, you've probably heard of oversouls. Yeah, I, I watched your video on oversouls. I think. Okay. So you can go ahead and give the listener a, a rundown. Well, um, basically your soul is not a lone creature. It's as you move up the dimensions, which your soul is connected to, it, it, your soul is actually a conglomerate of of many different souls and that's where past lives come from, future lives come from. There's a lot of talk now, especially since Oprah popularized it with past life regression. That's all in in your oversoul. Mm. So there's you, but you're also connected to your oversoul and those oversouls get greater and greater the higher dimen the, the higher up dimensionally you go and you can actually have past lives and future lives as beings that are not from earth. So that's sort of one And that's way. where it gets weird. People are like, what? <laughs> yeah, that's where it does get weird because we're very comfortable with being Cleopatra and um, Caesar and Earth-based past lives. We're very comfortable with that. We can imagine that. That's within our belief system and our paradigm. But the minute we start to challenge ourselves by thinking, well, well why can't I have a past life or a parallel life or an existence as another creature entirely. And if we look at the percentages to, to think that extraterrestrial life doesn't exist, that's really ridiculous. It's really small minded. So then when you combine that with spirituality um, and co the concept of God and divine consciousness and that we are all one, you can sort of start making these connections where yeah, it would actually make sense now that we're releasing this earthly ego-based kind of way of secular thinking. It kind of makes sense that maybe I would have a past life in, in, as an ET or another world. And mm -hmm. once you start going down that rabbit hole, everything just expands and you find out that this is a really popular concept actually. Yeah. And it's kind of the thing that you you mentioned once and then everybody tells you their experiences with it. And a lot of people also, the more clear and the more open you get, people actually have memories and experiences of these, these, um, these beings and of past lives with these beings. And that's what a star seed is, is essentially a human individual that has very strong spiritual connections via their soul with ET races and ET beings. And there's so many ET races that most oh, people yeah. are familiar with. Uh, yeah, there's there's so many. There's ones that are more prominent, um, and then there's ones that seem to be less prominent at this time. Um, but yeah, it, it's definitely coming forward, and it's going to be coming forward more and more because we're really expanding more as a society on this planet. Yeah, and when I started looking into the star seed thing. Um, you know, I was reading articles about like, which, which star system are you from? And here's like a, a description of all the different star <laughs> systems. And like, it's kind of like reading a horoscope, like, which one do I fit in? And it's like, well, I kind of take a lot of uh, qualities from all of them, you know, like one of them was like, oh, you're all an artist and you're a creator. And I'm like, oh, yeah, that's me. And the other one would be like, you're emotional and empathetic. And all you want is love and to bring people together. And I'm like, yeah, that's me too. Um, but and then some of them I didn't really resonate with at all. Um, but you know, like you said, we're all like, 
at this point in our sort of galactic lineage, we've had a ton and ton of experiences, and our souls have at least. And um, there's many chances that we come from several different star systems and had lots of different experiences in this galaxy. That um, and who knows? And that's all influencing who we are today. You know. Absolutely, it's it's the Fibonacci spiral. It's that integration of all the different pieces that we've experienced, and and the more in tune we become, the more we realize that you know maybe you have a connection to three three or four different star races, and you're integrating them in this life. You know, Earth is a very dense. 3D dimension, so it's it's a really great place to integrate a lot of different things, to ground a lot of different things. Yeah, so the star seed or the star system that seemed to resonate most with me, and the you know you said as in my in our last coaching session, and same same with other some other coaches said I had a strong Pleiadian um, connection. So to the Pleiades star system. And when I first heard that, I'm like, what's the Pleiades star system? I didn't even know that there was another star system. I don't even know what that is. So you can kind of imagine my sort of disbelief and then curiosity of wondering what this is. And it's like, so, and then I read this other book before I even knew anything about star seeds or star systems. It was called the, the Alchemy of Nine Dimensions, the Pleiadian Agenda and 2012 Prophecies. And this was given to me by a friend of mine, right after I started reading about esoteric subject matter. It actually started off with Eckhart Tolle's The Power of Now and a few other books by him, and then Robert Monroe's Out of Body Experience books, and those things started opening my mind up way beyond what they had been. And then I read Barbara Hanclaw's The Alchemy of Nine Dimensions, which got into the different layers of consciousness, the different dimensions of consciousness. And you talk about this physical reality is what a lot of people, or what is regarded as the third dimension, correct? Yes. Okay, so how does this, what are the dimensions of consciousness and how does that relate to star seeds and star systems? I think for the listener, this might be the point where they either turn off the radio, turn off their, their player, or it could start to get really, really interesting. <laughs> I agree. I, I do feel we're deep into it now. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, the nine, the nine, yeah, there's a lot of different theories on just how many dimensions mm -hmm. there are and are there dimensions within dimensions. And so this is all very esoteric, but um, the nine dimensions really, um, for, for, for me and my interpretation as an intuitive, is the different dimensions represent the different, dimen like uh, the, the different aspects of one way to look at it is your consciousness. And that represents different frequencies. So as you move up the dimensional scale, you're moving up in frequencies. And different types of beings can exist there. And different types of experience can be held within that reality. So um, when it comes to ETs and star seeds, a lot of people talk about Pleiadians, but or, you know, Syrians, but what dimension are they from? Meaning what part of their own evolution of consciousness are they in? So essentially the way I view di dimensions as well is sort of the further up the dimensions you go, the more merged things are, the more connected to the Godhead it is. So there's less polarity. Mm -hmm. So you're going to get different beings there. Um, and a lot of the higher dimensions, you're going to get telepathy, the ability to have telepathy. That's where the human race is going. As we shift dimensionally, as we shift into a higher density, we're also gaining those abilities because those are the abilities that exist within that dimension. Mm -hmm. So um, dimensions are essentially different expressions of, of consciousness. And once you attune to them, you can kind of get those, those um, abilities. You get the, you get, you can connect with beings from that dimension and their information. So does that make sense? Yeah, it makes sense. Let me try to um, break it down a lot simpler for the listeners um, and for myself too. I mean, so I could, let's give a concrete example um, from third dimensional consciousness. That is physical reality. And then you've got the thoughts going on in our mind, the things that we're thinking. You can't actually touch them or feel them or see them, but you know that they're there. Was that would that be fourth dimensional consciousness, or is it slightly off there? Thought, like the thoughts that you're thinking, mental energy essentially. Okay, and then what about dreams? 
Yeah, I would say that that's astral. A lot of mental energy I perceive as being astral energy mm -hmm. because it's sort of in between. It's not quite fully manifested into this world, but it's it's also not quite completely spiritual. Okay. So I would view that as the fourth. The, 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 the fourth is, is generally uh, the astral realm. It's like the in-between world between the manifested physical world and the pure spirit, what we perceive as the pure spirit, spirit world. Okay, so that's interesting. So people might have seen the movie like Insidious, for example, and then the, that's, a, that's a horror movie that's got a strong basis in astral projection and out-of-body experiences and lucid dreaming. So it's like there's this... There's this there's this dimension of space, what they call it, I forget what they called it, but um, where you could be hypnotized or go into an altered state of consciousness and then you, now your spirit self or your soul or whatever exists in, or your astral body exists in this other dimension that is, while your, your physical body is sitting there laying there asleep, your consciousness is traveling and it's thinking and doing and acting and in a different world entirely that can't be seen by other people. Um, and so this is where I, I started talking a lot about this in my blog is I had my own out of body experiences and started to learn how to control them and induce them and practice and, you know, get further out and try mm -hmm. to experience different levels and planes and, and, and then it got mixed up with, with dreams and lucid dreaming. Um, and I started to wonder, there's all this nomenclature, astral projection, out of body experiences, lucid dreaming. And you have, seems like different schools of thought. If you're in the lucid dreaming scene, they don't really talk about out-of-body experiences or too much of the spiritual stuff. But in, in the OBE scene, it's like near-death experiences, and it's like, I feel like I left my body. Things are different. In your opinion, are this, is this all part of the same, like, same thing? Yeah, I think it's the same. I think near-death experience, there's a much more physical aspect to it because that person is actually potentially dying. So mm -hmm. they're actually a lot more of their consciousness is essentially being pulled out of their body. Um, whereas lucid dreaming, there's, you're still more, con you're more connected to this planet because you're simply sleeping and you're not dying. But at this, but that said, there's more, like, it's essentially the same thing because you have, part of your consciousness leaving and going into the astral realm and potentially further. Yeah. And in my experience, the astral realm, um, looks a lot like the physical reality. So it's, I would have an out of body experience. I would watch as and observe my consciousness feeling like I'm floating out of my body and I'm in a, in my room. And sometimes I look at my bed and I see my body there. Sometimes I don't, I see nothing there. And then, like, sometimes the room is rearranged slightly different. Sometimes the colors are very more vivid. And it still feels really solid. And, and I think this is just on a part of the spectrum of consciousness and of, and of vibration. Like, the denser, the slower the vibration, the closer it gets to solidness feeling. So when you're in physical reality, that wall is really solid. There's no way I can put my hand through it. But in a dream, depending on how lucid you are or how what state of vibration that you're able to tune into, I guess, um, you can put your hand through that wall. It's, and, and it's, it's, you can, it's interesting because you can watch it, you can grow with it. Like at the first time I tried it, it was really, really solid. And then it's almost like if I just start to change my thinking and my thought or, or like believe more than I can put my hand through it, then it will go through it. And then that, that gets even further with being able to just, the, all of your reality becomes really uh, less dense and therefore controlled by your thoughts. And you can just imagine something and it'll manifest in front of you in the dream. And, it, and you can imagine, you can taste a fruit and it tastes just like a fruit or whatever. Or you can imagine that the, the fruit tastes like uh, something completely different and, it, and it will, it'll give you that, that sense, that feeling. Um, so it's almost like a, a clone of the physical world. But then as you get, I guess, deeper into it, stuff becomes less dense, less dense, less dense until you're, you no longer inhabit a dream body anymore or an astral body. You are literally energy and you can travel from one space to the other just by thinking and no longer does the world around you um, look physical. It almost can just look completely gray or empty or just all of a sudden you just have this feeling of unconditional love all around you, surrounding you, and you're not really in a physical world, but you're fully conscious and you're like, wow, you're able to look, actually observe this whole feeling of what's happening to you. So what is your take on that? I think it's an incredible 
and paradigm shattering <laughs> thing to to happen and um i always find it interesting how astral projection or lucid dreaming you know it, it it's always a reflection of what's going on a lot of the time in your in your personal life mm-hmm and I like how you said that, you know, you can, you, you can almost make it as solid as you want or unsolid as you want. Because, or as, you know, eventually when you really get into lucid dreaming, you can create any scene you want. You can do whatever you want. It's like, make your own reality. Yeah. And I think that's essentially a mirror of our actual life. Mm-hmm. That's what I think lucid dreaming can be used for is a tool to help you in your normal life, in your regular life. Yeah. uh, Charlie Morley, the author of um, dreams of awakening, he's, he has a really cool perspective because he kind of has a spiritual approach to it. Um, But like, for example, when I'm in my astral body or if I'm dreaming and I'm lucid enough to recognize that I'm dreaming and I can talk to the characters that are in my dream, I'm always confused on is that person I'm talking to a projection of my own thoughts of a subconscious like um, emotion that I'm feeling that's manifesting in a physical character in my dream or is it or is that a being, an, an, or could it be an, e, an ET being or an energy form that is maybe talking to me or influencing me? Or is it my higher self? How do you discern or distinguish? There's, for my experience, is that there's usually a spectrum of characters in your lucid dreams or your astral projections. Mm-hmm. Some are really clearly and obviously a manifestation of your current reality um they're literally a, a, a something that's happening in your life personified and you experience it they're, they're not really connected to an outside consciousness whether it be a deceased loved one or an et being or a friend and that there is an aspect of your life that is pu- purely personified and the, and the reason why you're experiencing it and interacting with it is you're actually working on your stuff on your issues on whatever's going on through that experience so sometimes it can be not related and it can just be something personified, whereas the other end is it can really be an actual ET being that's connecting with you. And because it's in your consciousness at the end of the day, it's in your dream or your astral experience, you have control over like how that looks and how it works. And you can change it, but the core of that being is actually interacting with you. Yeah, and, yeah. Or a deceased loved one is interacting with you. This is what gets really interesting with with energy and manifestation. You know, you hear a lot about the law of attraction. Um, you might people who are listening might have seen the movie The Secret or What the Bleep Do We Know as, on Netflix or something like that. But when you're in lucid dreaming, it's like you have the thought and then it can manifest, depending on how like practiced you get at it. And then, but in the physical reality, where you're in a much denser reality, your thought, which comes first, manifests in physical reality very slowly. Like sometimes it takes months to manifest a phys- in physical reality what it is that you were inspired by or this dream that you had. And so, for example, you're inspired. You go create something in the world. You you literally take steps to manifest what it is that you thought of. And um, William Buhlman, author of uh, author of The Secret of the Soul, says that everything in your life started out as a thought in some form. And so like that is your tool of creation. It's where everything starts, you know, your imagination basically. And um, and Kelly Lachey, who did the shamanic healing on me, she said that like that imagination has been squelched and squashed from modern day society. Like it's kind of looked at as insignificant or not a, not a big part of the world. Like it's just your imagination or it's just a dream. But I f- I'm starting to to re- remember how important imagination and dreams are. Uh, Gigi, what's your opinion on on that? Yeah, I do feel like imagination can be discouraged, and that can affect that can absolutely affect what you're manifesting because your ability to imagine, which is essentially visualize what could be, is directly I think related to what you end up manifesting in this world. Um, so I would, I would agree with, with both of those, of those statements. Everything has to start as a thought 
And we just said that, you know, thoughts basically come from the astral world, which is that in between place between the unmanifested spiritual and mm -hmm. the manifested physical. So that's, there's sort of like that little spark in the in between space. And once you have that little spark in the astral, the thought, the imagination, that's what takes you there. Um, it's just consistency that really grounds it. But everything does start out as, uh, as an imaginative idea or a spark. And it is really important that we, that we keep our ability to travel into that world via our imagination. If we don't have that, we essentially won't create genuinely from that place, from our heart, from spirit. Yeah, and what is imagination? Like, what is it? <laughs> like, what is it that... In can you describe where it comes from? Like why we have that ability? Like what is it? Is it just like chemicals in our brain or like? I think imagination is creative ability. I think that imagination is essentially our way of disconnecting from our identity and imagining or creating something new. I think it allows us to get out of ourselves and into something else. Mm -hmm. And it allows us to get out of our egos. And also imagination allows the inner child to come back. It allows play. And playing and having our inner child working is a huge, huge um, aspect of creation. We have to have our inner child. We have to imagine. We have to play. Yeah, I agree. That's really important. It's one of the things it's like we've been trained to not play. We've been trained to grow up. And that's perhaps what she meant by imaginations dying all around the world is mm -hmm. inner children. Our inner child is dying. And children are the most intuitive, psychic, intelligent beings we have. They just don't know necessarily how to apply that in this 3D world yet because they're new to it. Yeah. But at their core, they're so magical. They're so imaginative. Yeah, so you can use like lucid dreaming and stuff to to recognize signs from your higher self. And you know, when you start recording your dreams and writing them down, you can start to notice trends and tendencies and and start to interpret the symbolism that you see. Um, I think you know, so when I was reading Charlie Morley's book and he talked about he would see a scary thing in his dream and he would be lucid enough to recognize that it's just part of his fear that's manifesting as like a giant monster. And so he would approach it like he would he would love it. He would hug it and say, I love this part of you, you know, which is part of himself. And he would embrace it and then it would turn into like a puppy, you know, <laughs> <laughs> and then he would and then he'd wake up and he would feel inspired and rejuvenated and refreshed. And I think it does have a. Uh, it helps you in real life, like to face your fears. It's like you can practice in your dream state um, to face your fears. Yeah, and that will leak into your everyday life. Because you do look at other people. If you look, if you're in your dreams and you recognize that everything in your dream is a reflection of you, and you are able to manifest and control stuff in your dream, you feel safe and comfortable, and knowing that you are ultimately responsible for your for what you're seeing. And then, then you apply that to real life. You get in the habit of doing that. And then so you start to look at other people as reflections of you. And you say, this person is really scaring me. This person's really intimidating. Or, And then you can like, use that as a reflection on what it is for you to grow. But Gigi, can you explain that in simple terms for, for, for someone to understand that? Yeah, I'll, I can try. I would, <laughs> I, I would say that that anything that you can do in the lucid world with your consciousness because everything starts there will f will trickle down and affect you in your um waking life and they they just mirror each other and they're like any work that you do there is not lost it's it's you you actually get to see it and its effect in in, in your daily life and i think that when we can start viewing every relationship we have as a reflection of ourselves, I think that's when we really begin living a good life because mm -hmm. we begin taking responsibility for our actions and for who we are and our feelings and our stuff, our garbage, our junk, things that need to be released. We begin taking responsibility for that. And I think that what that's exactly what we're talking about at the end of the day with the astral world and astral projection is that 
what that person did when he turned that monster into a puppy was he was taking responsibility for himself as a creator. Mm -hmm. And that's, that action trickles down. And when we start doing that in our day to day life, wow, does it ever change? So what's a practical example? Um, well, if you have a lot of, if you're really working astrally and you're having, you know, say you're having the, like one of the really common dreams is actually driving a car with no brakes. Mm -hmm. So say you're, that usually means that you're feeling out of control. So say you're having that dream and you imagine you say, no, there are brakes in this car and you imagine brakes forming underneath and using them and you stop the car and you get out and you, and you, and you have that elated moment where you were in a tough situation and you changed it. Say you say you're, you're in that moment that will trickle down and you'll realize that next time in your waking life where you're in a problem where you feel powerless or you feel like things are moving too fast, you can actually in some way create a buffer or a break. You will naturally do that because you've done it already in your subconscious. So you'll, you, you will actually naturally apply that exact situation in your daily life now. Yeah, and for someone who's not skilled in lucid dreaming, I think obviously the same rule applies of uh, everyone is a mirror to your to your state of mind or state of growth or you know your consciousness's evolution. So for someone who, who can't really... Um, use the astral realm to, to to face their fears. How do they use the relationships that they already have for personal growth? Like, for example, their spouse or their business partners or their friends. Well, the core of really creating in the astral realm is just personal responsibility and making and realizing, hey, I'm in control of my reality. In the astral realm, you get to experience it play by play and actually physically, seemingly physically play with it. But that principle translates into the relationship to our relationships and the way we live our life anyway. So just simply taking on that response, simply, <laughs> so just taking on that responsibility and knowing that just by practice that everything, every relationship is a reflection of me. Every time I'm angry, it's a pro it, it could be a projection or it is a projection. Just really using everything as a mirror and beginning to train yourself as things being a mirror, that it, it's really just trying, really just applying that mindset over and over again and just kind of making it a habit, essentially. Yeah, I think just real quick, like, an, you know, an example in my life, just like somebody that you find really annoying, for example, or that you can't stand, that when they're around you, they give you this, you just get rubbed the wrong way. You're just really annoyed by them. And that's usually a, a an aspect or at least what I've discovered, it's like an aspect of myself that I've suppressed or that I don't like about myself that is driving me up the wall, particularly. I'm getting, I, me personally, I'm really bothered by it. So it's like, I think in one case, one person was really having a great time. They were laughing all the time. They're having fun. And I got mad at that. I got annoyed. Like, <laughs> you can't have that much fun. You know, we're supposed to work. And then as I did more, more shadow work on myself and I started to look, you know, talk to my inner child, the inner child wanted to play so badly. And I would always tell it, no, you know, like it's, we're not allowed to play. We have to be serious. And I got in trouble for being playful when I was a kid. Like I got yelled at for goofing off or something like that. So I would say, nope, nope, bad boy. In order to be good, in order to get along, you have to be serious and, and get good grades and try hard and all this kind of stuff. So I would, I would see people who are really carefree and lighthearted and kind of just aloof to the rules and stuff. And I would really get upset and aggravated until I realized what they were showing me. <laughs> it's kind of interesting to, to have that little discovery and I appreciate them in a different way now. <laughs> yeah. And, and it's so good that you could go back and follow that feeling of annoyance, almost like a vine right back into where it came from and pull up that root and look at it and then say, Hey, maybe I should integrate. Hey, maybe I should apply this because this isn't real. Or, you know, you, you, it, it, it's really cool that you were able to use it and grow from it. Yeah. Yeah, and I think anyone who's listening who wants to look more into that, just look up shadow work on Google, and you'll discover all sorts of uh, cool things to check out. And also recommend uh, Liquid Mirror, the book by Kelly Lachey. She talks about how using everyone as a, re as a reflection of you, and she's got a really good workbook, too. Um, but it's hard work. It's it's confronting all of the bad parts or all the parts that you don't like about yourself and trying to figure out where they come from and healing them. 
Yeah, and it's also this is also something that about it like for me sometimes it seems almost unmagical about it because we have this re- romantic ideal that people are different than us and they are who they are and our experiences are genuine and I feel like for me shadow work was always kind of like Mer, because <laughs> I, I like I really wanted to believe that I was having these genuine experiences with people and for me shadow work felt like oh maybe I wasn't but then I realized that doing the shadow work actually helped me deepen my relationships with them. So it was, it was, it, that work was really a process for me as well. Yeah. And as well as I still do it, obviously. <laughs> but yeah. Yeah, it's funny too, uh, Gigi, as we're talking about doing all this sort of high level work and, and we're trying to find meaning in like everyday life. And, and I was just reading this, um, I got a, a birth chart. And from from astro.com about like trying, you know, and I paid some money to like get a, an interpretation of it. And it's, this goes back to this whole star seed thing. Like, what does my birth chart say? It can kind of tell me a lot of psychological things about myself, you know, from a different perspective. So I was reading it. And one of the things it said about me was I'm pretty much floating in the clouds all the time. I'm constantly <laughs> finding important meaning in every little thing, whereas I'm not very grounded and like... um as opposed to someone else who's really just really grounded and they're able to just get on with the daily tasks. And that leads me to being absent minded. I'm forgetting stuff all the time. And I'm like, Oh my God, that is totally me. Like I like, you know, we're sitting here trying to figure out why are we with who, who we are and we are really digging into like the sources of our emotion and where they came from. Whereas someone else would be, yeah, whatever. That's pointless. I have to get this done. <laughs> mm-hmm. I just thought that was kind of funny. Yeah, we're all it's, we all have a bunch of tools in our toolkit, you know, of what we of what gifts we have innately and and what we have to work on. Astrology, I love astrology for that. Yeah, astrology is something that I'm starting to get into because of the whole star seed thing. I'm trying to make sense of it and and I went on this website, the Star Seed Hotline. Have you been on there? No. So Starseed Hotline, it was really bizarre how I got on that site. At first I saw it and I look at it and it looks like a website from the 90s. I'm like, okay, this is ridiculous. I'm not going to, this is, you know, of course my graphic designer, uh, you know, ad, you know, personality kind of comes out and I immediately have a judgment. But, and then it wasn't until I got, a, I wrote that Starseed post in my blog and then weeks later I get a message from somebody I met in high school and he had, I had not really talked to him for probably over a decade you know, he wasn't like a friend or anything. He was just an acquaintance. And he wrote me and said he really was resonating with my post. And he's a starseed too. And and he met Lavendar from the starseed hotline. And, and they were amazing people. And, you know, I was like, interesting. So I went back to the starseed hotline. I was like, all right. So I just paid for a, a reading, you know, like I they, they interpret my birth chart and stuff. So they're telling me all these things about the planets and where they're aligned and all these degrees and like it looks like gobbledygook to me because I've never seen anything like this. I've always obviously heard about horoscopes and stuff and it's kind of fun to poke around in there. But but as far as real deep astrology in terms of set, you know, why you are behaving the way you are and um, as far as star seeds are concerned, she would look for particular star markings for, for like um, common patterns that she's seen over the years. And she, you know, she would go by like the degrees of when, what certain planets were cert- were where and she, it was interesting as she interpreted mine as like basically i was born right in this time of like there was a beam of <laughs> okay i don't know how to explain this <laughs> it's so really difficult for me to explain especially from someone who doesn't understand the language quite yet but she, th- this is the words that she used she said now don't fall out of your chair but this is the same markings as jesus christ and mary magdalene and and pioneers like that and she said, now don't go getting a messiah complex. There are m- millions of people with these same star markings. But these are the type of, pe- this is the energy that you're bringing into this world, you know, like, and I was just fl- like, wow, you know, this is insane. Um, but that's sort of like what star seed research can do. If you're, you're sort of like looking into your galactic lineage and getting a better understanding of what your purpose is here on Earth. It's all about like my purpose here in this incarnation. What am I supposed to do? Absolutely. It's a very, very deep, deep look at how the stars move in you, how the universe moves in you. And um, it's it's much, much, much deeper than any other personality test that you're going to that you're going to get. That's a good, a good analogy. It's like a personality test for like someone who's 
you know, they've seen Facebook personality test. It's kind of fun <laughs> to fill out. So imagine taking that to the hundredth degree. <laughs> like, I got like, like an innate level, like we're talking about the part of you that never changes. Yeah. Think, you know, like we're talking about the unchangeable you. We're not talking about the part of you that was shaped by how you were, your, your parents raised you and how many TV commercials you've seen. We're talking about the part of you that is innate, that doesn't change, that doesn't waver. That's what looking into astrology does and, and how that's expressed. That, that's what those kind of readings are. Um, and that's why they're valuable too. Yeah, so let's talk you're about... how to express yourself and you're learning these really deep parts of you. And once you know that, you start to really be able to use them and have them work for you and you find a deep comfort in your being um, because you finally kind of get a better sense of who you are on a deep level. Yeah, and I think that's why I'm attracted to it. I don't. I think it's because I want to know who I am and where I come from and why I'm here. And I'm not content yet. It's like I just love digging into it and learning about the why of what I'm doing and, and, yeah. and my and tendencies you, and stuff. Yeah, and you, you can only go so far with learning about yourself. Eventually, you need to go to other people, other mirrors, and have them tell you who they are from their perspective to then integrate it into yourself. So you can only really go so far, and that's why intuitives are so popular. I mean, even astrologers and stuff were so popular because, you know, you can only get to a certain point within your self-development until you you kind of need to go somewhere else and and and, and see, see where you're fitting, how things are going. Yeah, so it gets into, like, finding your purpose. Um, that's one of the reasons I called you was just curious, curiosity about, like, what is my purpose and what would, what would you see as an intuitive? Um, so I think, and especially with my, my festival that I started, it's a lot of it, it seems to come down to, you know, the authenticity of the work that you do. Like, why am I doing it? What's the purpose? A lot of people think that their purpose is here to make the world a better place or to change the world or something like that. A lot of graphic designers and artists and creatives get into the field thinking, I'm going to change the world somehow, some way. And um, then they come a period of time where they get jaded and they realize that the world is a harsh place and they are very small. But <laughs> what is your, what is the whole point of like finding your purpose and why is it so popular today? Well, one interesting point that you said is, is that feeling about when you find your purpose, making the world a better place. That's because when you genuinely dedicate yourself to your purpose, the side effect of that is the world becomes a better place. Mm hmm. So when you're in your heart and you're in your purpose, everything around you softens and you put such intense good energy or intense, not good, powerful energy into the divine matrix that connects us all that it actually does change the world. One individual in their heart doing what they love can, can literally, even though they're not talking, not connecting, they're alone at their computer, they're alone in the woods, whatever, can literally change thousands of people, if not more not even consciously connecting with them. That's how connected we all are, and that's why it's important to be in your heart. But it can be frustrating when you interpret that feeling literally. So mm -hmm. when you think that I'm going to change the world through this work, not, really, not realizing that that feeling isn't supposed to be, you know, interpreted that literally, and then, you know, getting discouraged. Yeah, I think that's really important, what you just said, that when – there's a pressure to be valuable to society. You're raised with, what are you going to do for everyone else? And then there's a, you're encouraged to be selfless. And then when you act in a way that's trying to find my own purpose, like I'm going to try to do what I like, there's a guilt factor that some, some of us are raised with that's like, no, this is selfish. I think I'm supposed to go help people in Africa. Or I'm going to, um, yeah, you know, like everything that I write has to be, it has to help someone else, otherwise it's worthless. Or like, I can't do anything that's self-serving. Or and, and even like the guilt feeling of being perceived as somebody who is selfish hinders a lot of people on this path. Which is so completely backwards because the most selfless thing you can do, whether it be in your career and helping the world or in your relationships, is be selfish. Yeah, it's, and and it's and it's selfish in and of itself, worrying about other people perceiving you to be selfish, and so you act in a selfless way, like you sacrifice, you spend, 
you, you're the last one to leave the office every day for in, in a very small way. Like I am giving so much to this company or something like that. And then, and then I don't get anything in return. <laughs> but that breeds resentment. If yeah. you're, if you are doing something for the greater good and you start to feel resentment creeping in, you're not doing something for the greater good. You've idealized what you think is the greater good and you're doing it and resentment will form in that shadow. So really being really contributing is always, always starting from a place of going inward and you, you might actually feel very, very selfish doing it, but there won't be any resentment. Yeah. And you're, you're totally right. And I think for a person who's in that place, I know someone in particular who's um, having a very large problem. They spent most of their life being selfless and listening to kind of Christian teachings that say, be a blessing to others and don't worry about yourself. The reason why you're unhappy is because you focus too much on yourself. So start focusing on other people and you'll find happiness uh, or pleasing, you know, like helping others. I think, and then of course she's, she's very depressed and, you know, wondering what the point of it all is. And feeling guilty because all she wants to do is probably have some self-care. Yeah, right. And, you know, she's at the, I, I give and I give and I give and I never get anything back and no one respects me. And it's like, oh, I, I know what that pain feels like, you know, um, you kind of have to. And this is what I told her. I said, if you if you live in if you f figure out what your joy is and you're able to do what truly makes you happy within your heart, obviously, you've got to settle down. You've got to connect with your heart. You can't be you can't sit there and listen to what religions tell you and you can't listen to what the media tells you or other people. You have to literally spend time alone a lot and listen to yourself. And then when like, and I've noticed in myself a change when I do that, when I am coming from a heart space that I feel like I trust this inner knowing and I have a good relationship with it. Um, I do feel more confident in, in my decision making and in everything that I do. And also it's almost like the desire to help people is enhanced. It's amplified. In, in, in a way that never was before. I no longer feel like I should help somebody, but more like I, I want to. I have no choice. I can't, I can't help it, I guess. It's like the... It's natural. It's like I just want to share the love that I have rather than feeling like I need to go give somebody money so they can get off the street. Yeah, like that's an obligation. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great word too, obligation, versus just straight up desire, straight up love, that, that unconditional love that you get from loving yourself unconditionally like it's it, infinite it just positions you to give and it's natural to give because when you love yourself and you have that you're giving yourself self-care you're tuning into what makes you happy you're following your dreams you become so abundant that all you want to do is give and serve that's how that works um obligation is if you are obligated to give you're just trying to reverse engineer that feeling. Obligation is probably the most awkward way to interact with people imaginable. <laughs> <laughs> so so mm -hmm. that's not good. <laughs> yeah, so we've talked a lot. We're kind of, we're kind of kind of getting close to the end. So I just want to give you a chance. Is there anything that you want to say that you want to that you're that you've been inspired by lately that we haven't got a chance to talk about? Hmm inspired what have I been inspired I haven't been actually I feel like I'm going to be reading a lot mm. soon but I haven't actually been reading too much I'm, I'm really inspired by usually like mundane day-to-day -day things people in my life how they interact and what makes people tick usually mm -hmm. yeah so do you have any advice for creators for makers who uh, believe it's their calling to create and, um, you know, they may be struggling? Yes, absolutely. Um, if you're feeling blocked, inspiration and creativity usually hides in the part of you that you don't want to look. That's what I would say. Awesome. I love your conciseness. Oh, <laughs> well, thank you. Not many people can just say what they want in one sentence. <laughs> Well, I try. <laughs> and so what do you, what's on your, the, the plate for you in the next year or the next three months even? I'm going with the flow. I'm going to be working with 
people one on one like I always do. Mm -hmm. um, coming when it comes to the fall, I'm going to be doing more videos and seeing where that goes. I'm going to be writing. I'm sort of um, just going to be doing a lot more public things as soon as the fall comes. Yeah. And I'm just going to kind of see where that takes me. I don't have any real, probably going to be doing maybe some traveling, nothing, nothing huge, just going with the flow. Yeah, and I kind of admire that because I think it's going to be where I'm headed in the next year, you know, going a lot more going with the flow, like, and I think it's going to be exciting. It's like, I have no plan. I'm just going to let it go yeah. and see what, see where it takes me. Let my higher self guide me. That's, that, that, that's essentially where, like, that's really where I've wanted to position myself is to, is to really just take any, like, real obligations, take them down to almost nothing um, or as little as possible, and then just kind of see what comes forward and act on it. That's where I've positioned myself for the next little while to see what's, because that's, that's where you really see what's real, yeah. you know, so. I love that, like taking the obligation, which we just discovered was <laughs> no good, like acting out of obligation, taking that out, and then what's left is creating out of joy, passion, desire, and a sincere you know, ability to help. And, and so you get way much more authentic creating and living. And you get to see your own personal rhythm. You get to see how you flow once you take away how other people expect you to flow or how they want you to flow. You get to see how you actually do. And the sooner you can realize that in your, in your life, in our life, the sooner we can integrate that, the more genuine of a life we'll live. Yeah, that's amazing. I, I would, obviously, I would love to pick your brain about the, the how <laughs> that's going to happen <laughs> for most people. Like, you know, like, how does that, how do you set your life up for that? But that's a whole nother podcast. So <laughs> that's a whole other podcast. Yeah. yeah. So um, do you want to close with anything? Where can people like, uh, do you want to have any recommendations, favorite books, podcasts, movies, inspirations? Uh, well, we love David plugs. Data. David Data is the man. <laughs> <laughs> we love David Data. I, I really, I really recommend that a lot because I feel like, especially a lot of this new age information or spiritual literature, it can kind of be very feminine in nature. Mm. And I really w w would recommend David Data, especially because we've talked about it. Um, so I would, I would, I'd probably recommend something in that line, which would be David Data, which talks about masculinity and balanced masculinity and how to apply it in your life. It's a really great book, especially for men who might find the spiritual world to be lacking specific guidance towards them. Yeah, so he's got a book called the, the Way of the Superior Man. Mm -hmm. um, which I read, I, I ripped through it in a couple of days. I mean, it's actually really a, an inspiring read because his chapters are so short. It's yeah. literally like two to three pages a chapter. So you can just like read it in a short little stint and uh, get some, get a lot out of it. But he is kind of scary to read because he's going to make you question like your, your masculinity and question your values of what being a man really is. Um, so he's, he can be kind of controversial, but at the same time, he comes from a, a really authentic place of love and it's like that's sort of what he preaches and it's like boy you know I, I listened to it and I was resonating with most of it but then there are parts that terrified me because I just feel like I don't know if I can be that kind of man you know like that seems like this is this perfect ideal I don't know if I can get there like I'm afraid you know some part of it was like really challenging yeah it, it definitely unearths a lot of this of the stereotypes and a lot of the it tries to straighten out a lot of a lot of things that are essential, like that need to be worked on within the male consciousness at this time. Yeah, it's it's really deep, though. It's really deep. Like he doesn't mess around. So, have you seen any of his videos? Yeah, I have. I, I've seen a few of them. On, there, there's not too many on YouTube. But and they're kind of old. They're like these seminars that he did, where he gets people up in front of the crowd, and it's incredibly awkward. But then it's incredibly like. <laughs> Freeing. I don't know how these people were so brave to do it. I'm just picture. I'm awkward in my seat watching it, but that just shows you where I'm at with my development. I think, you know, with my own views of masculinity. Like I, I've come from a place of you have to treat women like a queen and put them on a pedestal and nice guy, nice guy, be nice. You know, I've had I've had like an intense sort of disdain for jerky guys, all this kind of stuff, and we kind of grow up this this squelching of the divine masculine energy in men. 
And um, we tra- and what David Data puts it nicely. He says that in in the forties and fifties, it was you know all spine, no heart. This macho man ideal. You know, the woman was a housewife or whatever. And then now that there's been the sixties and the the seventies and sort of this new feminist movement, there's been sort of a a backlash against men, against masculinity in general. Not not necessarily men, but the masculine energy. And so, like, men became more feminine and became embracing their feelings and singing and dancing and being in tune with their feminine side. And so I think now it's almost like we're growing up out of that to integrate both sides and um, becoming the superior mas- or superior individual. I wouldn't say it's men or women. That's another thing I like about David Data is he, he, he puts respect to same-sex marriages or same-sex relationships and um, different uh, you know what I mean? So like, it doesn't really matter. He he puts it in man versus woman, you know, in in that scenario, because that's just how he wrote his book. But he does pay respect to different types of relationships. But he's talking about energy, masculine energy, feminine energy, how we each have both of it. And one's not do- one's dominant and one's, you know, submissive or whatever. So it's really interesting. I, I love the book. I wrote a blog post about it on my my own site. So yeah, it's 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 incredibly timely for both men and women to read. It, it really straightens out a lot of questions, I think, that are floating around the dinner table or, you know, in the bedroom between people. I think it just really, it's a very intuitive for our society right now. Yeah. Yep. All right. Anything else? I think that's it. I think we covered a lot. All right. Well, it's been great talking to you, Gigi. I love, uh, we got real deep, real fast, esoteric. We got pretty far. So this is, I think, is a, a brilliant episode for Make or Mistake or podcast number one. So um, we'll see where it goes. I mean, uh, so I think for people to get in touch with you, how can they get, get in touch with you? Yes, thank you. Uh, you can go to my website, which is www.ggyoung.com. And I have all of my stuff on there. So that's yep. the way. I recommend you hire her for a session and uh, see what she can tell you about yourself that maybe you're not thinking about or whatever. I think it's totally cool to, to get into that kind of stuff too. So, well, thanks a lot, Gigi. And um, we'll talk soon. Thank you so much, Jeff. Bye-bye. Bye.